Well, that's Ronnie Floyd inviting us to join him for the National Day of Prayer. Ours will be on May the 1st. May the 1st. That's Wednesday night. This is our uh, church-wide prayer time, and it's going to be a unique time as Miss Amy leads us, and we're going to be doing prayer stations. And so she's asked us uh, to go over to the New Family Life Center. We want you to wear tennis shoes over there. And uh, is that not right? We're starting in here. Starting in here. We'll come here. Okay. Open. Okay. 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 The big thing is this. We need to love our nation back to God. Uh, aren't you proud to be an American? Uh, I am. And I'll tell you, America is a divided nation. And if we're going to see this nation, you know, I've never thought in my lifetime I would see a president that is outright hated. I mean, I mean, bold hate. There is hate in America. Or Donald Trump. And the Bible tells us whether we support our leader or not, we're, we're, I mean, whether we voted for him or not, we're to support him. We're to stand behind him is because the Bible says no one is in authority unless God puts them there. That's what the Bible says. It's in Romans. So you and I need to realize that uh, we need to wake up as Christians and we need to be praying. Prayer works. And if you don't believe that, then you probably won't be here Wednesday night. But prayer really does work. So if you really believe in the power of prayer, I invite you to join us as a church along with uh, churches throughout our nation. Probably most churches will be doing what we're doing Wednesday night, May the 1st, and then the, uh, it will be observed. This is a, uh, a law that was in place by, I believe, Harry Truman put it in place, and uh, that we would have a, a day of prayer. And the theme is love one another. And so instead of preaching, and I thought I would, I would love to preach this message, Calvary Through the Eyes of Angels, because that would be a great follow-up uh, after Easter. Uh, but, you know, I, I got to thinking, and the Lord really got to speaking to my heart about this theme for our National Day of Prayer. I think it is a valid theme. It's a theme we need to study. Again, thank you, kids. The children did an awesome job today. And you know what children need? You know what moms and dads need? You know what churches need? We need love. Everybody needs to be loved. So if you take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 13. John chapter 13, we'll read only two verses. John 13, and these are the verses for our national day of prayer in loving one another. John 13, and we're going to read verses 34 and 35. Let's all stand together in reverence to the reading of God's holy, infallible, inspired, and errant word. A new commandment. I give unto you that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye have love one for another. Will you note there three times he is saying love one another? He says, I give unto you that ye love one another. Then he says, I have loved you that ye also love one another. And then if you're my disciples, you will love one another. I believe that's coming from the triune God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we're going to pray that we'll love one another. Let's pray. Father, I pray for your Holy Spirit to be at work here today, for only by the power of God can we love. It's not in our human nature to love. It really is not. It's only by your power that we can truly say, I love you. We're here today because we love you, God. That's the reason we're here. We've come here to worship you in expressing our love, just like uh, Mary with the alabaster box. Lord, yes, she did something out of the norm. Uh, women were not appreciated in that day. Uh, it was very bold on her part to come in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and to worship you the way she did. But you told your disciples that she was anointing your body. She was getting you ready. And I pray today, Father, that we would love you with that alabaster box, that we'll show you, not just tell you, that we really do love you. And by doing so, we will love one another. I pray for your fresh oil of anointing. Pray that I'll say nothing more, nothing less than Jesus here today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. You may have heard about the woman 
who was uh, walking along the beach one day, and she found this bottle. She picked it up. She wiped off the sand, and poof, yes, a genie popped out. He said, I'll grant you one wish. She said, what do you mean one wish? I thought genies granted three wishes. She, he said, no, times are tough. Economy's tough, and only one wish you get. So she pulled out a map of the Middle East and said, I want these countries to stop fighting, and I want them to get along. In fact, I want peace and love and harmony in the world. The genie looked at the map and said, Lady, be reasonable. These countries have been fighting for hundreds of years, and every peace treaty they've signed has been broken. That simply cannot be done. Wish for something else. The woman thought for a minute and said, Well, I've always been without a man. So I, I, I want to find the right man. You know, a man who's considerate and fun. He likes to cook and help with the house cleaning. A man who would get along with my family and not sit around and watch sports all day. A man who will uh, smother me with love and affection for all my life. That is what I wish for, a good man. The genie let out a sigh and said, okay, you win. Let me see that map again. <laughs> Some things seem impossible, but with God, nothing is impossible. So I want to say this to you. There is hope for the United States of America. It really is. You may not think so. You may think we're too far gone. But if we could do what I believe God led Ronnie Floyd to lead our nation in is to love one another. We could just do that. We can look at enemies on the outside, but we will be wise as a country to look within. Historian Will Duran in his book on Roman, uh, Rome's history it's titled Caesar in Christ said, and I quote, A great civilization is not conquered from without until it has first been destroyed by itself from within. The essential cause of Romans' decline lie in the people and the morals that was in decline. That's where we are in America. There is a difference, though, between Rome and, by the way, the U.S., we are 243 years old. We're getting pretty old. America, though, was founded upon Judea Christian principles, values. We've strayed from that original vision of our founding fathers, and what was once freedom of religion has now become freedom from religion. We have succeeded in pushing God out of our schools, our sporting events, our public venues, and our workplaces. Then there's the breakdown of the family. This, this has to be said here today. So many of our social ills today can be traced right back to broken homes. Most children born in the U.S. are born out of wedlock now. Did you know that? These are recent facts. 63% of youth suicides are from fatherless homes. 63% of youth suicides are from fatherless homes. 90% of all homeless and runaway children are from fatherless homes. 85% of all youth sitting in prisons grew up in a fatherless home. It's been said a family can survive without a nation, but a nation cannot survive without a family. We need to turn to God in prayer and turn back to his word. Peter Marshall, I don't know if you ever read any of his books, but he was the former chaplain of the U.S. Senate, said this. I thought this was worth quoting. The choice before us is plain. Christ or chaos? Conviction or compromise? Discipline or disintegration? America has seen times of Great Awakenings, it's happened before. The first Great Awakening was in 1740 to 1742. It was led by such men as Jonathan uh, Edwards and George Winfield. And during just those two years, over 50,000 people were added to the New England churches out of a population of only 300,000. The second Great Awakening was in 17, the 1790s to 1840, and it was led by men like Charles Feeney. It was during the time of the Wild West. The law was disregarded, and sexual sin was rampant. The camp meeting, which was what they called it back then, the Great Awakenings, where crowds numbered as high as 15,000 would be uh, held for several days at a time. Thousands came to faith, more than 10,000 in Kentucky alone between 1800 and 
1803. The third Great Awakening in America was from 1857 to 1859. And this revival was really unique. It all began with a 48-year-old man by the name, he was a businessman by the name of, 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 of Jeremiah Lanfear. And he became a prayer, it all started with a prayer meeting there on Fulton Street in New York. It started with just a handful. It was started real slow. But the New York stock market crashed along that same time. And soon Landfear's prayer meetings were attended by hundreds and thousands. Prayer meetings broke out all over New York City, filling theaters on Broadway. Within six months, 10,000 people gathered daily for prayer throughout New York City. It is reported that 50,000 New Yorkers were converted from March to May. That's only, what, three months? During that single year, the number of recorded conversions throughout the country reached an average of 50,000 a week for two years. God has done something before. He can do it again. And then one of the, probably the last awakenings that you've probably heard about is uh, the Youth for Christ and, and the Jesus Movement. That was, that was where God really did a work among our young people. Did you know most revivals started with young people? It really did. You know why? I think their hearts are soft and they're tender and they're open to God. But how are we going to see revival in our day? Well, I think the three words are up on the screen. Love one another. I think that's how we're going to see revival in our day. How is it going to happen? Well, number one, there's a commandment to love. Jesus gave us this commandment. A commandment, he said, I give unto you that ye love one another. God wants to do a new thing for us. Sherry and I memorized the scripture when we first met, Isaiah 43, 19. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Our God is a way-making God. There is nothing impossible with our God. He is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all or ask or think. Well, how is this commandment to love going to work? Well, number one, look who it comes from. The Lord of love. A new commandment, he says, I give unto you. Jesus is Lord of all, and he has the right to issue commands. Amen, church? Yeah, he has the right. The command is not based upon feelings or emotions, but on obedience. If he is love, and he is the Lord of life, then we will love one another. Here's the greatest of all commandments. Let's move quickly, because i got to get into my last part. But he, he is, hey, there's no debate. There's no discussion. I don't need to preach it. He's the Lord of love. You will not know love apart from God. God is love. You can't love your husband. You can't love your wife. You can't even love your children without God. It's not in your capacity. You know what we're seeing in America? And by the way, when the, when the going gets rough, we see who we really are. And we're seeing a lot of hate in America. We're seeing a lot of things happen in America that says a lot about our hearts. You know, storms have a way of revealing who we really are. If he's the Lord of our life, and he's the Lord of love, then we will love one another. And here's the greatest of all commandments, the law of love. The second part, the law of love. That ye have love for one another. Matthew 22, 37, 40. Here's the law of love. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy soul. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is likened to it. What is it? Thou shalt love thy neighbor as I say, if we did that, that would solve the world's problems. If we wouldn't be at war, no, we'd all be loving one another. Well, that's what this great law is all about. Jesus is laying the law down at the very beginning of establishing his church. And by the way, it's not his church if this law is not in practice. It may be your church, it may be my church, but it's not his church. It's only his church when the law of love is practice. Yeah, because he's love. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbors, love yourself. To love one another. That's the law of love. And if you and I are truly saved, then the law of love is written in our hearts, according to 1 John 4, 8. Whosoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. The third thing, the life of love. Life of love. He says, as I have loved you. Now, how did he love us? He loved us with his whole life. Jesus laid down his life 
in love. John 15, 13, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. We like to sing the song here at Gordon Springs, I am a friend of God. But are we really a friend of God? Jesus said we are his friends if... If you do whatsoever I command you, he has commanded us to love one another. 1 John 3.16. I know we know John 3.16, but do you know 1 John 3.16? It says, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for one another, for our brethren. And that's really what it means to love. Think more of others than you do yourself. Now, that's, that's a tall order. We're going to get into that right now because we've been called to love. That's the second thing. There's a call to love. Verse 35, first part. By this, that is the call to love, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you have love one for another. Because of the cross, Jesus has put his call upon our life and his love in our hearts. You see, our love for one another is only, because, only possible because of what Jesus did on the cross. Now, we just had a wonderful time last weekend celebrating his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And because he lives, we live also. Well, he has called us as his church to love. He's called us as a nation to love. That's our call. It's possible because of Jesus and his finished work at Calvary. Had it not been for the fact that he paid for our sin and had given us a new righteous nature, we would be unable. We wouldn't have the ability even to love one another. I can love now because he first loved me, the Bible says. What do we do when we grow cold and stale? Well, I'll tell you what we do. We go back to the cross, the very fuel of our worship, and where love came down. Let's all quote it together. We know the verse, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Is that not the gospel? That's it. I mean, you want to put the Bible in a nutshell, look at John 3, 16. We've been called to love because we've been called from darkness to light. Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So my first point is darkness to light. We were in darkness. We were alienated from God himself. But when the light of the Lord Jesus Christ came into our life, he lit us up. And there ought to be passion. There ought to be love. I mean, and there ought to be compassion. Amen. I mean, think about it. We are no longer children of darkness. We are children of light. And as children of light, we're to do everything in light. We're to do everything according to the light that lives in us. We're called to love. Darkness is seen because of sin. Lo light is seen because of love. And God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. He brought the light of the world to us. Second of all, we've been brought from death to life. Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, His love lives in us. I want you to look at this for a moment. Because, you know, love really did change everything. Let's look at this next slide. Think about what he says here. Love changed everything, passing from death to life. Let me read that verse. 1 John 3, 14 through 16. I'm hung up on 1 John 3, 16 now, so listen to this. We know that we've been passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. We are the called of God. We are the children of God. We're called to love our brother and sister in Christ. And if we do not, we are still in darkness, and we are dead to the things of God. I'll tell you what Jesus did as we celebrated last weekend. It changed everything. I mean, literally, it even changed the calendar. I mean, think about what he did for us. He, I mean, listen, church, there was a transformation that took place in our hearts and a transfusion of his love in our blood. Yeah, we no longer have just human blood. 
as a Christian, we have the blood of Christ applied to our life. Amen? That's why we call each other brother and sister. We call ourselves at Gorge Springs a band of brothers and a circle of sisters. How can we do that? Because love changed everything. That's what he did on the cross. And then destruction to love. We were on our way to destruction. He says in Psalm 103, 4, Who redeemed thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. We are called to love one another, not to destroy one another. Gossip is always destructive. And it is not love. It is hate. I don't know if you've ever been around a hypochondriac, someone who always thinks they're sick. You ever met people like that? I mean, they cough and they look online, and now they have the bubonic plague. I mean, they, 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 there's, a, there's a red spot on their arm, and they're thinking they're dying with leprosy when it was just ketchup left from lunch. I mean, how in the world can a person get off track like that? I'll tell you some of the problems. We may not be a, hydro, uh, a, a, a hypochondriac, but we can become very suspicious you know, such people live suspiciously. Everything is a clue with a deeper meaning. Too often we view others with greater suspicion than a hypochondriac views a sore throat. We don't give others the benefit of the doubt we give ourselves. Romans 12, 9 says, Love detests evil and is always patient, not suspicious of others. There is a destructive form of evil that we have been called uh, uh, out from. We were on our way on a collision course. I mean, we were heading to a devil's hell, but love came and rescued us. Amen. That's what he did. He pulled us up out of that miry clay. He set us upon the solid rock, the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's established our going. Well, time is moving quickly, but I want to just share with you what I believe what God wants to do in our life today. If we would just come to this one last place, and I know this may not make sense to you. Hang on. This is, this is some of the Ronnie thinking, but just get with me. Stay with me. Because not only have we have a commandment to love and a call to love, but these disciples had something heavy on their heart. There was a cross to love. Now, don't you think about that, because you and I have a cross to love. He says that ye are my disciples if you love one another. We have a cross to love. Don't you absolutely love what Jesus did at the cross for you? I mean, I, and here's where I believe love was spilled out. I mean, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. And, the, and what I want to talk about now is the whosoever. Because I don't know what you believe, but I believe he died for all men. God loves every human being who walked on the face of this earth. He loves you today. And you can't do nothing to make him love you less, and you can't do nothing to make him love you more, because he loves you unconditionally. But the question is, where are you in your love relationship? We have a cross to love. Don't, don't you realize that we are disciples of his love and of his cross? The cross is the grand central station, and every part of our life runs out of it. Someone recently pointed out uh, here at Gord Springs, I didn't notice, and I've been here five and a half years and never seen it. But some, one of the members pointed out the other week that there are three crosses on the front of our church. I said, Really? They said, yeah. So I looked and they said, yep, you see the cross on the very top of the steeple? Yeah, I've seen that one before. Well, there's a cross that's on the base of that steeple as well. Right there at the bottom of the steeple, there's another cross. And then there's a cross laid into the brickwork that holds the building together. Notice I said the cross that holds us together. Hmm. And then what happens? It won't in the drawings. It won't going to happen. I was shocked that in the blueprints, there was never a cross drawn for the front of the building as far as the blueprints. It was in the rendering of the artwork, the presentation. And so CSI said, hey, don't worry about it. We'll pay for the cross. And so they put the cross on the Family Life Center. So what does that cross about? Well, it's a cross for you and I to love. I mean, nothing should happen apart from the cross. The cross of Christ is for our transformation and for our transfusion. There's a transfusion that had to take place through the very blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that, that resulted in uniting us in His love. He called it the new covenant of love. That's my first point. 
A new commandment I give to you, he said. The New Testament is the new covenant of His love. It is God's love letter to us. From Matthew to Revelation, He's saying, I've entered into a new covenant of a relationship. Uh, you were alienated from me because of your sin. But Jesus died on the cross as we preached the other week. He is the agent. He is the minister of reconciliation. And He, 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 he brings the sinner and His Holy Father together at the cross. And now we have a new covenant of love through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Every time we love one another, we are in essence saying, we love the cross that Jesus died on. That's what we're saying. We love that cross because the only reason we exist as a church is because of the cross. You give me another reason, and I'll tell you it's a wrong reason. Well, we're a social gather. Wrong reason. I mean, there's a lot of social meetings going on. There's a lot of good people that do good things and they come together. But we're, we're not just good people. Jesus didn't die on the cross to make us good. He died on the cross to make us godly. He didn't die on the cross to make us a bunch of nice people. He died on the cross to make us a bunch of new people. There's a big difference. The cross made all the difference. The new covenant of His love. And then where I was in a hurry to get to, because I want you to get, this is the most important point from my heart to yours is this. A new community of love. A new community of love. Three times in these two verses, Jesus is saying it. I think he, you know, in seminary they teach you repeat things so people can remember them. Well, Jesus repeated this three times. He didn't need to go to seminary, by the way. He wrote seminary. Uh, he said, love one another. Love one another. Love one another. The one another's are his disciples. When Jesus was on earth, how would someone know that a person was a disciple of Jesus? Think about that. When Jesus was on earth, how did people know who his disciples were? The answer is easy. If they followed Jesus around from place to place and listened to his teaching, then they were one of his disciples. Now, the question is, now, how will the world know that you are one of his disciples? How you love one another. That's exactly right. They will know you are disciples because I'm forming in you a new community that will operate on the principles of my love. And folks, without love, 1 Corinthians 13 says, you are nothing. So without Him, we're nothing. We are to not only be a people of the new covenant, but we are a people, the church, the new, the new community. He laid down his life for the brethren. He says, we're to lay our life down for the brethren. Followers of Jesus will love others more than we love ourselves. There's a major commitment of love. This is a major commitment. What does that love look like on a practical level? If you love others like you love yourself, you'll give others the benefit of the doubt. We're so suspicious of other people. We distrust their mo motive. We act like other people are criminal masterminds, intentionally weaving a web of lies, trying to entrap us. Instead, we should give others the benefit of the doubt. Never should we be fault finders. We are to be about love, forgiving, understanding. Uh, it was the Pharisees. It was the Sadducees. It was the people who were religious, who were always pointing out, what, what, Jesus, what is your motive here? What is your motive there? There. I mean, he healed people in the name of Beelzebub. By the way, that was blaspheming against God. They often questioned him, and ultimately they said, crucify him. But who are we? What should be the identity of this church? Should it be this building? Should it be the steeple on top of the building? Should it be a, a digital sign that cost a lot of money? Should that be our identity? Should the new building be our identity? No, our identity must be the love that God has put within our hearts. That should be our identity. So that's why I want to close with, because I'm going to challenge you now with a new commitment of love, a new commitment of love. He says, if, now there's a condition, if ye have love one for another. Here's where we sink or swim. Here's where we live or die as a church. There is a condition. He says, if you have love for one another. We must move from conditions to commitment. That is what Jesus did. He, he made an unconditional commitment to love. Church, here's my challenge to you. Will you decide today that you're going to be identified by love? Would it be 
You say, preacher, have you ever seen it happen? Yeah, been there and done that. Seen what it looks like, it's a beautiful thing. It's amazing how God gets all the glory and honor because I'm telling you, church, listen to me. If we as a nation continue to move in the direction we're moving in, we're going to destroy ourselves from within. There's no other country that can destroy us from without. We've got too big a military. We're too strong. We are a very strong people. And you let a 9-11 happen, and we all come together real quick. But is it going to take another 9-11 for us to come together as a nation? How are we going to come together as a church other than love, a new commitment of love? You can't do anything to make him love you more. You can't do anything to make him love you less. This is the love of God. Or every organization is identified by certain characteristics. Now, let me give you a picture. If you see a big brown truck with yellow letters and a man dressed in a brown, uh, a brown suit, and he steps out to deliver a package, you can identify the organization. What is it? UPS, that's the UPS guy. You see a fast food restaurant. All you got to do, you don't need a name, you just see arches. What is it? McDonald's. There's a branding. There's a branding. Uh, you know, Apple, I've always been fascinated by this. I, no one else ever thinks like I do. But I, I, I was thinking this. Apple with a bite out of it. I immediately think of Adam and Eve. <laughs> I do. I wonder. They call it the smartphone. I wonder if it's the sin phone. I mean, I, I wonder because, you know, it certainly, and by the way, I got to say this. I'm going to get down here and just tell you like it T.I. is. You know why we don't love anymore anymore? We don't love you? Because we're texting each other. I mean, I, I'm fascinated. Here's a boy and a girl dating. I've watched this in restaurants. <laughs> All they text, I don't know what they're doing. They're not talking. They're texting. Everybody's looking down. You walk, people are texting, emails. Here's the problem with texts and emails. I really do detest them. I like the personal touch. You know why? You can text someone and someone can interpret that as a wrong tone. But if they heard your voice, it may sound like entirely different. It may be a loving voice there instead of, you know, I got a text last night from somebody, and I know that that's not what they meant because I cared to share it. I said, what does that mean? She said, I don't know what it means. It, you know, what do you call it? It, it auto... Auto-correct. Auto-correct. <laughs> that was Amy. <laughs> and I asked Sherry, I said, what does this mean? And I was going to call her, and I thought, well, if I call her, it might embarrass me. So I don't want to, because it was, you know, anyway. I, I'm like, I, I, I don't, I, I'll just pray, and that's all that matters. Here's the thing about texting and emails. We're losing relationships. How can you build a relationship with a text? And I'm just, you know, and I text. I do, I text. You text. But church, we're called to love one another. So what is the new commitment of love I'm challenging you to do? One thing that I have been shocked at, I've just never been used to this. You know, I've had people say, preacher, there's... New people in our church. Who are they? Well, here's my challenge for you, church. <laughs> Tear them out the lunch and get to know them. Oh, I thought that would go quiet. I mean, really, seriously, I need to, I'm preaching to me. I need to do this. A new family comes in our church to say, would, would you like to go to lunch with me today? Well, that got quiet. You say, preacher, that might cost me something. But what you're gain is a relationship. It might cost you something, okay, it costs, it costs you whatever to carry them out to eat. But what a blessing you get to know that person. I need to do that better. You need to do that better. We need to be intentional in loving one another. You've got to decide. So here's the invitation, and you can't believe, the day's a miracle day. It's 3 to 12, and I'm done. <laughs> We're fixed, uh, you don't have to clap, Carol. Uh, <laughs> I'm done. But here's the new commitment I'm asking you to do. Y'all got me off track now. The new commitment is this. Will you decide today what kind of church you want to be? I said, will you decide today what kind of church you will be? What kind of church? If you will make a commitment to truly love one another, I'm going to ask you to stand. Even if you're a guest. If you will make a commitment, I'm going to love my brother and sister in Christ. 
And I'm telling you, church, all of us have to stand. You know why? Because we may not, I may not like Eric, but I love him. I also like him. It's a plus when you like somebody. But you know what? It's better if you love somebody. Amen. You may not like, I know there are people, and I, I feel uncomfortable these days. People say, well, why, why do you wear a tie? I, I, I don't know. I just always want a tie. <laughs> I know the going thing for the preacher is not to wear a tie anymore. And just, you know, I guess I'm going to start coming this summer with my shorts on and my shirt up. Nah, nah. I got to be me. Look up here. I'm, I got a point. I got to be me, and I got to let you be you. Amen. I don't care whether you wear a tie or not. It's not worth falling out about. <laughs> Look up here, church. Let's don't fall out over little petty stuff. Amen. Who cares? Who gives her? You know what my burden is? Our director of missions told me this week, there are 65,000 people that live right here in the radius of this church, and they're all going to hell because of us. You know why? We're the salt. We're the light. We're the answer. Are y'all following me? We, 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 we've got the Lord Jesus. Amen? Amen? How can you say you love God and not want to share him with someone else? Amen. Oh, man, I tell everybody I love Sherry. I'm proud of it. I love her. I mean, she's, she's just absolutely best wife. But I love Jesus more. So guess what? Let's go out and tell everybody who Jesus is. Out of love for him. Brag on him. We talk about the weather. We talk about everything else. We text everything. Let's start telling everyone. Has someone asked you today that they love you? Well, Jesus loves you. And I love you. I want you to tell someone that today before you leave here. Tell someone that you don't even know. I love you. Thank you. Just for being here today. We're fixing to sing a song without him. And the Bible says... Without him, we can do nothing. I can't love you. You can't love me. But with him, we can do all things. Father, in Jesus' name, we've all stood to our feet to make a commitment to love one another. Even as you first loved us. That's why we can love one another. Because you first loved us. May we be intentional. May we value each other. We don't know anyone's heart here today. No one knows my heart, and I know no one's heart here today, but you know all of our hearts. And I ask for the Holy Spirit now to come at this invitation. Holy Spirit, would you just move in our hearts today? Because only by the Holy Spirit's power can we really genuinely love one another. I pray for your anointing at this invitation. If there's someone that don't know your Savior, I pray today that they would come to receive the unconditional love of God that Jesus died for them. He, you love them today, Lord. You love them so much that you're willing to save their soul. Your love is greater than their sin. If there's a Christian here today and they've grown cold or stale, I pray today that they'll come to that cross and just be loved all over again because, Lord, your love is everlasting, unfailing. Thank you, Lord, that you're all that we need. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing together.